before we get started, uh, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, please keep your video and sound off during the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please use slide.do with the following code 93711. So if you type that into your browser, slide.do 93711 for the code, you'll be able to ask questions there. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will then go through any questions. So please um, upvote any questions that you would like answered. Um, and this event is being recorded right now. I'll get going in about a minute, but um, yes, about one more minute and then we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, morning or evening, wherever you are. Uh, I hope you're doing well and lovely to see so many people at today's presentation. Uh, today we have the pleasure of Dr. Wootenoven presenting his more recent work as a joint presentation between the Oxford Water Network and the Oxford Hydrology Group. Uh, the Oxford Water Network forms uh, part of the Oxford Networks for the Environment, which include networks on the converging challenges of climate, food, energy and biodiversity. In particular, the Oxford Water Network address, uh, seeks to address key challenges of water security, use knowledge uh, to inform policy and planning, and develop instruments to improve practice in partnerships with government, research, and business communities. Um, now, without much further ado, it gives me much pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Wouta Noben. Uh, he is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Saskatchewan and board member of the Young Hydrologic Society. His PhD is from the University of Bristol, and he has both a BSc and MSc at the University of Twente. He has published work in leading international journals, including Water Resources Research, GAO Scientific Model Development, and International Journal of Climatology. And his research focuses on three main areas. Firstly, using knowledge from experimental data, uh, basins to improve continental domain models. Secondly, model structure and certainty, realism and benchmarking, and finally, hydrological similarity. We're honoured that Wouta is giving us a presentation today. And so without any more delay, I will hand you over to Wouta to present his work. Thank you, Wouta. OK, um, well, thanks, Marcus, for uh, inviting me to do this talk. Thanks for the introduction as well. Uh, thanks to Catherine for doing the technical support here. And um, yeah, let's uh, let's get started. Let me just really quickly organize my screen a little bit because my uh, my Zoom bar is now covering the uh, controls for the presentation, which is a bit annoying. Let's see if I can make this go away. Yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so um, this talk is about investigating common assumptions about hydrologic modeling in a large sample approach. Um, it is part of my uh, PhD, which I completed in 2019, um, supervised by Ross Woods and Jim Freire from the University of Bristol. Jim is now uh, part of the University of Saskatchewan, um, also uh, supervised at the time by Murray Peel and Keenan Fowler at the University of uh, Melbourne. And uh, a special thanks goes out to my current boss, uh, Professor Martin Clark, who actually lets me spend time on uh, finishing off my PhD stuff while I'm working as a postdoc for him. Now I had some introduction slides about myself, but Marcus has already covered that, so we can skip these. Um, this is actually very close to our office, which is what we uh, like to do in our free time here. Um, and about this talk, what we'll be talking about here is a very basic introduction to model structure uncertainty. Um, I'm not really sure about everyone's background, so I figured starting at the very basics is probably helpful to some of you. Um, I'll briefly outline the experiment that we did, and then we go into some significant detail about what we actually found in this uh, study that compares 36 models over 500 catchments. Now, the first question uh, that we should probably start with is, um, why should we care about model structure uncertainty? 
Um, this shows a sort of typical modeling chain with observations, model choice, model parameters, initial boundary conditions, uh, all of these working together to give us model simulations. Now, all of these aspects are uh, inherently uh, reasonably uncertain, and this all combines into model simulations that are themselves uncertain. And this is important when we use these model simulations for predictions about the future, and especially when they're used to inform management decisions, because in such scenarios, you really want to understand to what extent you can actually trust these model simulations. And now to highlight why the model uh, choice is important, which is mostly what we try to focus on in my PhD work, uh, here's a very basic example. So imagine we, uh, we have a catchment that has 10 precipitation coming in and five stream flow leaves. Now, uh, defining a sort of black box model that um, simulates this catchment is not very difficult. Uh, so here's two examples. Uh, both of these models under current conditions are absolutely perfect, right? They take 10 precipitation coming in, and they give us five stream flow back. However, um, once we start to use these models under different conditions, so imagine a future that is quite wet, uh, these models uh, either predict that we get double or triple stream flow that we do today. And similarly, if we imagine a future that is quite dry, these models give us very different results as well. Um, and of course, this is an absolute toy example, but if we look at a more realistic, application, um, we see the same thing. So this is a study by Melson et al. from 2018. And what they did here is use different climate models and three different hydrological models. So that's Vic, Sacramento, and HPV. And all of these three hydrological models are considered you know, equally plausible representations for all these catchments in the US. And what they try to investigate here is whether these models are actually in agreement about the uh, upcoming changes in the future if you use these climate models to project the future. And the test they did was really quite basic. So what they wanted to know is, do, do these models predict the same change in mean flow? So are these in agreement that the mean flows are going to go up or the mean flows are going to go down? And in these dark blue dots here, these three models actually agree. So they are the, all three of them say, yes, uh, mean flow goes up or mean flow goes down. In any of these other colors, um, these models are actually in disagreement. And some of them say it's gonna go up and others say it's gonna go down. Um, and I think this is, a, this is a more realistic example and really highlights that choosing, that the model ch uh, you choose to do these projections really matters. And this is not just an academic exercise. Um, here's an example from uh, the Donnelly River in Australia where they are working on a plan to build an irrigation dam. Um, and this, this plan has uh, people who like this plan and this plan has people who do not like this plan. And much of the controversy uh, around this plan centers around the modeling approach that they've used um, to support these decisions here. They use uh, conceptual bucket models. So uh, GR4J and uh, LASCAM. And what people are worried about is that these models may not be able to do long-term changes in groundwater. Uh, quite accurately, which might be important in this uh, particular catchment. Also, say hi to my cat. Uh, this is probably going to happen quite a few times more. So let's get her out of the way. Um, yeah, about this example here, uh, note that I'm in no way judging the modeling study that was done here. I don't know this study. I don't know this catchment. All I want to make clear here is um, these models are used in practice to support decisions that have great impacts on, uh, on the environment. So better understanding the differences between these models is relevant. And the problem here, and also the problem in this, this Donnelly River case is uh, if we want to get the right results for the right reasons, um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with this quote by now, um, we'll need to use the right models in the right places. So we need to know which models we can, we can use where. Um, and these pictures are three pictures that I've taken uh, around here. And in terms of space, these are within 100 kilometers of each other. But in terms of dominant hydrologic processes, these are really very different. So we need to figure out how to use, uh, how to find the right models for these places. And one of the problems with um, what I call here the traditional approach to model setup is that these, this traditional approach is not very good at detecting issues that have to do with model structure problems. Uh, so typically what you would do is start with a catchment, uh, choose a model, um, calibrate your model, and then perform some form of evaluation where you give your model unseen data and see whether some score is above some level that you put somewhere. 
Uh, and if, if it is, then you carry on with your study uh, as you planned. Um, and this is so widespread that I think if you just go uh, into Google and you type in the name of your model of choice and you add climate change, I think you'll find uh, at least one example of somebody doing something like this there. Now, the problem with this approach is that model choice should be based on a fitness for purpose, you know, like we saw in that Donnelly case. Um, but often um, it can be motivated by different concerns as well. Um, you know, everybody is low on time, uh, so maybe setting up, um, maybe investigating all the possible models for a given place takes too much time, but you already have one set up for somewhere else, so you just use that model set up. Or maybe you work in a laboratory that has really invested quite a bit in finding, uh, in, in developing a single model, so that's the one you use. Um, and what makes this more difficult is that we don't really understand very well yet which models we should use where. So finding the right model for a given uh, place and purpose is, takes quite a bit of effort. So the bottom line is that there are too many models and we don't really understand the differences between them well enough and more research is needed. Um, and that's what motivated our work here. Um, so what we did here, we decided to investigate as many of these models as we could, uh, as we could find and see if we can find any, uh, learn any interesting lessons. Now for this, we use a multi-model framework uh, because mo uh, model comparison is just easier in a framework that is designed to actually let you compare models. Um, it means that code can be reused for model setup and for uh, data analysis. It allows you to investigate individual modeling decisions and at least the numerical implementation uh, is consistent across all the models. Um, so even if this numerical implementation has some drawbacks, uh, at least those are shared uh, and this allows for fair comparison. Um, as you may have noticed from the introduction, our focus is on these lumped uh, deterministic conceptual models, also known as bucket models. Um, and that is because you have to draw your, your line somewhere, right? We can't do everything and this is the this particular scope that we chose. Now, model frameworks um, are not new but none of them really did what I uh, needed them to do. And especially in many cases, user friendliness was, wasn't great. Uh, documentation was sometimes pretty minimal or non-existent. Um, so instead it seemed easier to me to just uh, make my own. Um, and what I came up with is what we call uh, the Marmot toolbox. It contains MATLAB code for 46 bucket models. Um, and these are quite different in terms of their structure. They have uh, between one and eight stores and between one and 23 parameters. All these models solve their model equations with an uh, implicit Euler numerical scheme. And there's a lot of documentation that goes into this, uh, into this whole framework. And in my humble opinion, it's pretty easy to use. Um, well, you see these models looping on the, on the right here. Um, this is, uh, this is all, the, uh, this is all, these are all the models that we have. Um, but for this particular study, one of the drawbacks of Marmot is that it is not very fast. Uh, we're working on changing that right now uh, in a collaboration with the University of Melbourne. But at the time, uh, even by completely abusing a supercomputer, I was only able to calibrate 36 out of 46 models. And uh, this is our, this is a brief uh, description of our experiment setup, um, 500 catchments from the Kendall's US data sets, 36 models and three objective functions. Now for the Kendall's data set, uh, originally this contains uh, 671 catchments, but we uh, pre-selected uh, some, uh, we removed some based on water balance considerations. Uh, and for the remaining ones, there's 20 years of data available, which we divided into uh, 10 years calibration data and 10 years evaluation data. This is all uh, run at a daily time step uh, with 36 out of the 46 models that Norman gives us. Our objective functions are uh, based on the Klein-Gupta efficiency. Um, we do this on uh, regular stream flows, uh, one over stream flow with the idea that this more emphasizes low flows and as a sort of multi-objective approach that combines the two. And that brings us to uh, the first question uh, that we try to investigate, and that is where do models perform well? Uh, and note that in the following, for every catchment in the data set, we have 36 uh, calibrated and evaluated models. But for this particular aspect of the study, we just look at the best model in each catchment, meaning the one that obtains the highest evaluation score. <clears throat> 
Now, uh, we are, of course, not the first people to, to, to try large uh, sample modeling, and uh, we can define some expectations of what we expect to see. On the left here, again, we see uh, that figure from the Melson et al. paper, and this time I think we should focus on these black dots and crosses here and here. Now, these, uh, these uh, icons indicate uh, two models are non-behavioral or all of them are non-behavioral. And in this particular study, that means that these models do not get a KGE score above a 0 0.5. And if we look at a different paper, this is Newman et al. 2017, uh, where they calibrated both a VIC and a Sacramento model for, uh, for this same domain. We see a similar uh, picture appear, uh, but this time for the mesh subcliff efficiency score, these scores tend to be low here and here. And uh, Newman uh, summarizes this as follows. Most surface hydrological models perform worse for runoff generation in arid basins, particularly in daily time step and watershed scale configurations. Now, that's exactly what we were doing. So, you know, why not let, why not see if, if we see this as well? And um, we do. Uh, so these are the KGE values during evaluation uh, in each catchment showing just the best model that we found. And this pattern is, uh, this exists here as well. Here, our KGE values are quite low. Uh, same here. Not all of them are below 0 0.5, but they're not, you know, they're not as high as 0.9 or something what you get up here. However, findings such as these are uh, conditional on the baseline that you compare them against. And in terms of Nash Sutcliffe efficiency, this has a really convenient built-in benchmark at NSC0, uh, which means that you're comparing your model simulations to a mean flow benchmark. The problem with this mean flow benchmark, um, as Shafley and Gupta point out, is that this is not the same everywhere. So here are two catchments uh, from the Camels US data set. Uh, one is in Yosemite Valley and one is in Arizona. Now what we see in the Yosemite Valley case is that this, this stream flow signal is very seasonal. And the mean flow, the straight line here, is not a very good predictor of the day-to-day -day flow regime. It is a, a very bad predictor of the day-to-day -day flow regime. In this Arizona catchment, where the mean flows are very low, compare this, uh, this y-axis to this one here, the mean flow is actually a pretty reasonable predictor of the day-to-day -day flow, um, apart from this single day where there is a high flow event. And this means that this benchmark is not an equally strict test in both of these cases, because in the Arizona case, you know, doing better than that straight line is probably not very difficult, um, because all you need to do is match the seasonal signal. Um, in this Arizona case, there is really no seasonal signal beyond that straight line that the mean flow already gives us. So outperforming that benchmark in that case is probably quite a bit more difficult. Now, we obviously don't use NSE, we use KGE, and KGE has no built-in benchmark, but it has a similar sensitivity to seasonality. And we can easily see this by looking at some synthetic data. What we've got here is some synthetic in, uh, observations with very low seasonality in black and some synthetic simulations in red. Uh, and these are simply um, the observations plus uh, a 10% random error added on top of them. And the KGE score in this particular case is pretty low, it's minus six. And I don't think anyone would typically consider that to be very good. But now what happens when we increase the strength of the seasonal signal, uh, but still keep this 10% error on top of the observations, we see that um, when the error has the same size as the observation, uh, when the error has the same size as the seasonal signal, uh, the KGE score starts to go up and it becomes approximately zero because the correlation component and the variability components move closer to their ideal value of one. And when we make this seasonal signal even stronger, but still keep that same 10% error on top of the observations, uh, so on a day-to-day -day basis, all these three models are equally wrong, uh, we see that this KGE score goes up even further. It goes up to 0 0.6 already. Um, and now if we take this experiment to its logical extreme, we keep increasing that seasonal cycle uh, while keeping that same 10% error in place. We can see that as the seasonal signal becomes stronger, these KGE scores become, you know, nearly perfect. And this means that if you draw the line for a good KGE score at a... Uh, fixed KGE value, you implicitly consider that errors of a certain magnitude are less important in more seasonal catchments. Um, and we know that the seasonality in the climate signal can be very strong. So in more seasonal catchments, as long as your model does not mess with the signal in the input data too much, 
achieving these higher KGE scores is not very difficult. So instead, what we try to do is the following. Um, try to answer the question, can my model predict departures from the seasonal cycle? Um, we're not running our models at an annual time step, so maybe comparing it to a long-term benchmark isn't very helpful. So let's see what we can do when we compare it to a more uh, short-term benchmark. So what we did is uh, we took the calibration data for each catchment, uh, put all these years one on top of another, uh, as you can see here, and then for every uh, single day, took the mean flow on that particular day. Uh, and this is what we call a typical flow year. What we then did is put all these typical flow years uh, back to back uh, for as many years as we have in the evaluation data and just treat this as any other simulation and see what the KGE score is that we obtain. And in this particular catchment, uh, obviously specifically selected to be as extreme as possible, uh, this benchmark already gives us a KGE score of 0.87. And that, that this is just the seasonal uh, signal that you see in the calibration data carried forward into unseen data. That is the score that your model should beat if you want to know whether it can predict these departures from the seasonal cycle. Now, um, this is what this looks like if you do this across the entire domain. Um, and suddenly you see that these benchmark scores, they can be, they can be very high. Uh, especially in snow dominated catchments where the seasonal signal is very strong um, and relatively stable in time, these benchmarks tend to go, tend to go up. Um, but across the entire domain, typically they are uh, a fair bit higher than just using the mean flow as a benchmark. And when we now compare our uh, model evaluation KGE scores to this particular benchmark, uh, we get the following. Obviously this is not so easy to compare, so it, it's much clearer to just look at the difference between the two, which we do here. And what we see is how the best model per catchment um, performs um, depends really on, uh, on the benchmark that we have in place. So if this is blue, uh, the, the model beats the benchmark. And if this is red, then the model does not beat the benchmark. And what we can see is that in 11 catchments, mostly located in the mountains here, uh, not a single one out of these 36 models actually beats the benchmark. And the differences in these catchments can be quite pronounced, um, where the benchmark itself can be up to 0.2 uh, KGE points higher than what the best model can achieve. Now, of course, if the benchmark is already at KGE is 0 0.85, then the room for improvement is not very big, right? There's only, there's only 0 0.15 left until you reach the perfect KGE is one score. Um, but this still gives food for thought. Um, in these 11 catchments, something in the modeling chain must be wrong, right? Um, maybe the input data is biased, maybe the parameters that we selected aren't great, maybe it's the model structure itself. But the fact that these models don't outperform the benchmark uh, there should give us reason to further investigate what's going on. Um, obviously, we didn't have time to actually do this, so uh, we went for a different question instead, uh, which is, where do models perform well? Um, and these are two pictures from uh, Adder et al, the paper that introduces the camels data set, uh, showing the aridity of the camels catchments and how much uh, of the precipitation there falls as snow. Now, if we just look at, uh, at our uh, absolute KGE scores that we saw um, and we compare these to aridity, we see that as aridity goes up, these KGE scores have a sort of tendency to go down. And this is absolutely in line with, uh, with the findings from Nelson et al, uh, from Newman et al, and from many other studies that have looked at similar things. If we compare um, model evaluation KGE scores to snowfall, we see that there is, you know, if there's more snowfall, they tend to be higher, but the relation itself is not very strong. Now, if we flip this around and look at the improvement over benchmark, we see something very different. Uh, there is a very strong relation with uh, snowfall and improvement over benchmark. Now, of course, this can be partly explained by the fact that if the benchmark is already high, the maximum value for delta KGE is, uh, tends to be, uh, will naturally be lower. But if we look at the aridity, uh, again, aridity going that way and delta KGE being here, uh, we see something that's quite interesting um, because there doesn't really seem to be a relation there. And the improvement over benchmark is uh, quite similar to, um, but it doesn't really, it's not really explained by the aridity at all. So maybe this, this statement by Newman can be updated a little bit. Yes, most surface hydrological models perform worse for runoff generation in arid basins, 
when you compare them to a mean flow benchmark. Uh, when you compare things to a seasonal cycle benchmark, model performance is not markedly different in arid and non-arid catchments. And of course, we've looked at just the, um, just the best model in each catchment uh, in this analysis. But if we look at all the models across all the catchments, we see something similar. Um, slightly different aridity scale, but dry is here and wet is up here. And if we look at just absolute KGE scores, we see this trend of uh, scores being higher in wetter basins. But if we look at the delta KGE, the improvement of benchmark, what we see is that in, in dry basins and wet basins, um, the, this improvement is approximately uh, the same. Now, um, on to the next question. We've now looked mostly at the best model in each catchment, um, but that doesn't really tell us how many models are uh, approximately equally good in every catchment. So uh, now we move on to how high is model like refinality. And for this, we can define some expectations by going to uh, Perrin et al. Uh, from 2001, uh, which in my opinion is an excellent paper. Um, they did, no, I did something that is very similar to what they did. Um, they uh, compared the performance of 90 models in uh, approximately 400 catchments. And what they found was that for 41 of those catchments, there's virtually no difference uh, between the first two models in any given catchment. And what we can do now is uh, go back to our benchmarks. Um, in those 11 catchments where no models beat the benchmark, um, I don't think there's any point in looking at those further. So we've excluded those catchments from further analysis. Um, and for the remaining catchments, what we can do is see how many models actually um, beat the benchmark. And that's how we define uh, the plausible model structures in a, given, in a given catchment. And what we see on the right here is the number of models that outperform the benchmark. And there are some, there are some interesting patterns here, uh, especially in these arid basins, where the number of models that beat the benchmark is, uh, is quite low compared to the rest of the domain, uh, which tells us that you can probably find some models that work reasonably well in these arid catchments but not all of them do, and you need to be quite careful on how you select them. But interestingly, for most of the domain along the coast, everything in the east here, um, for the vast majority of catchments, all of these models can actually outperform uh, the benchmark. Does that mean they outperform the benchmark by equally much? Uh, no. So uh, what we see here is uh, the maximum model KGE in every catchment, and on the right we see a CDF of uh, the number of models per catchment, that are within 0.01 KGE difference away from the best model. So this is what we could call virtually indistinguishable. And for at least 200 catchments, you'll be able to find at least one model that is within this KGE value um, on evaluation data, so on unseen data, away from the best model. And this number goes up to eight. So in a few catchments, uh, there are actually eight models that you can find that are this close together. And if we, uh, if we reduce this threshold, if we make this a little bit more lax, of course, the number of models goes up. Um, I particularly like the, uh, the, the orange line, which is uh, a KGE difference of 0 0.05, um, because these uncertainty, uh, no, these efficiency scores tend to be quite uncertain themselves. So I think considering everything within uh, 0 0.05 difference away from a model to be effectively the same, I think that's fair. Um, and what we see is that in, uh, in the vast majority of catchments, you'll find at least one or two or three or four and up to 28 models that are that close together um, in terms of efficiency scores on, uh, on unseen data. So essentially, this confirms what Pagan et al. found. Uh, for many catchments, multiple models can be found with virtually identical performance in KGE terms. And this matters for studies that investigate the impact of changes. If we go back to that traditional uh, model setup that I showed in the beginning, if all we do to find out whether our model is uh, reasonable or good to use for the study is compare our model performance to a certain um, global efficiency score and say, okay, well, this is above uh, 0.75 NSE or this is above uh, 0.80 KGE, so it must be good. Um, these results imply that that might not be the case because there, there could be many other models out there that achieve similar scores while being structurally very different. Um, 
So a high KGE score is not evidence of a Fidelius model structure in the sense that um, the model does not necessarily faithfully represent the dominant hydrological processes. You do not get that information from just looking at NSC and KGE scores uh, alone. And of course, these, these thoughts are not new, right? And like we know this, there are many opinion papers that show this. Um, but I think this large, looking at this in, across such a large sample uh, makes this a bit more tangible. Um, and it really is an argument for a more thorough evaluation for when models are used to predict change. Um, yeah, so uh, the next interesting question that we can look at is, um, okay, these models are different internally. Um, can we explain this by the number of model parameters? Um, because we've had some issues with this in the past, here are some really quick uh, examples and definitions. Uh, this mostly concerns uh, overfitting. So what overfitting is, um, here we have some uh, data in blue, which is essentially just a quadratic curve with some noise added on top. And I fitted a, a second degree polynomial to this in orange. Um, and you know, this fit is pretty good because this, is just, this, uh, this fitted curve essentially just follows the pattern that underlies the data and it has an RMSC score of uh, 1.4. Now we added noise with a standard deviation of 1.5, so that's approximately what you would expect. Um, and now, if we give this, uh, if we give this model this fitted curve some new data, um, which is essentially just a calibration uh, flipped back to front, we see that the RMSC score barely changes because this model uh, has fitted uh, the pattern underlying the data, but not the idiosyncrasies in the calibration data. Now, if I now throw a ninth-degree polynomial at the problem. Um, we can fit the calibration data nearly perfectly. Uh, RMSC score is, is practically zero. But this model has fitted the data errors so well that if we give it new data, that this RMSC score suddenly goes up very quickly. Um, and this is the issue that we would ideally like to try to um, and avoid. Uh, we know that this is, a, this is an issue with regression models, with statistical models. Um, so look, for example, at this, uh, this figure from Lutz and Luce 2017, where we see that if the degrees of freedom go up, calibration performance starts to go up. Um, and we can go back to Peren at all because, uh, you know, all I'm doing is reproducing their work. And they looked at a similar issue. Uh, when the number of parameters in the model structures goes up, calibration performance on whatever this metric is, goes up as well. Um, now, it's pretty easy for us to test whether we see these patterns as well, um, but instead of looking at mean scores across the catchment sample, we just look at box plots. So what we see here is uh, the box plot of uh, calibration KGE scores for uh, the simplest model that we have that has a single parameter. Now, if these expectations are true, what that means is that we would expect this box plot probably to, to narrow and to move towards the upper right as we increase the number of model parameters. Um, and this is what we get. Um, here are some, some helpful lines to you know, make this, make comparing this a little bit easier. And what we see here is that we don't, we don't really see that, um, that calibration performance has a, has a consistent tendency to go up when our models have more parameters. And especially if we look uh, around here, where our models have nine and 10 calibration parameters, these, these scores are actually about as bad as this first model here. Um, so yeah, there are definitely differences, um, but this doesn't really seem to relate to the number of model parameters. And of course, this is visual assessment, but we use some statistical tests as well, and they confirm this. Models are certainly different, but you cannot really predict uh, this by just looking at the number of model parameters. Now, okay, fine. Um, maybe we don't see this pattern in the calibration scores, um, but maybe what we actually should be looking for is um, a reduction in performance due to this overfitting when we give our models new data. Uh, as we see here in this figure from Lut and Luce, um, when a model is not overfitted, the uh, performance between calibration and uh, new data is relatively similar, but once these models become overfitted, this uh, the validation performance, the performance on unseen data drops. Um, and Perrin looked at this as well and says, we propose to quantify robustness by the decrease of average performance between calibration and verification. This is a well-known but undesirable feature of hydrological models. 
And so they did. And what they found was that, uh, again, on this, the, the mean values for this uh, C2 criterion, when there's more model parameters, this, um, this tends to go down. Uh, so these models become less robust the more free parameters they have. Now we can look at this as well, of course. Um, and what we see here again is a box plot across all the uh, across all the catchments where this model um, beats our benchmark. And what we see here is that in uh, about a quarter of the cases, we're actually in for a pleasant surprise because this model does better on evaluation that, uh, data than it did on calibration data. So that's that's good. Um, what we don't really like is this uh, are these negative values here where uh, the evaluation performance is lower than the calibration performance. And now we can see that even this very simple model, um, you know, has a fair reduction in performance on about three quarters of these catchments. Now, what we would expect to see if these uh, expectations are true is that these box plots have a tendency to shift uh, towards the lower right. Um, because as these models have more uh, parameters, we expect them to become more overfitted and thus lose performance and become less robust when we give them new data. And again, um, here are the results of all of our models. Here's a, here's a line to guide your eyes. And what we see is that, you know, in approximately a quarter of these cases, maybe a little bit less than a quarter, uh, performance goes up when you give the models new data. And in the other cases, performance goes down. But this does, again, not really seem to relate to the number of model parameters. Um, again, we did some statistical tests and they confirm, yes, models are definitely different, but the number of parameters is not the main uh, predictor of well, when these things are going to change. So maybe it's time to uh, slightly revisit this, this statement um, and uh, make this something like, while models show a decrease in evaluation performance in approximately 75% of cases, this does not seem to be related to the number of parameters um, and how the parameters are used seems much more important to um, dictate model performance than the number of model parameters that uh, a model has. And that leads us into the following. Um, okay, so if these models are different, but the number of parameters is, is not the main uh, predictor, you know, which, which one of them then is, is best? Um, and again, back to Perrin et al. Um, and what they saw is uh, that most amazingly, in, you can at least find three catchments in, uh, in their sample for which any one of the 90 model structures uh, is, uh, is one of the best. And this indicates that the ranks are still dependent on the characteristics of the test sample. So of course we did the same, um, slightly different. Uh, what we see here is how often each model in our uh, sample ranks in the top three when you give it new data. And most amazingly, we see the same. It is typically possible for any model in the sample to find one or two or three or up to 150 catchments where that model is in the top three. And this is a very interesting uh, point to introduce some results from the other three objective functions that we looked at. Um, because what we see here is that some of these models, um, when you sort them by uh, increasing number of parameters, one parameter here, 15 parameters here, some of these um, are doing not as well as you might, as you might think. Um, but when we start looking at these models on different objective functions, uh, we see especially for model 22 here, when we move to a uh, low flow objective function, this model becomes one of the best choices in, uh, in about a quarter of the catchments that we have. Um, again, emphasizing that maybe it's not the number of model parameters, but the way they are used that really dictate the model strength and weaknesses. And of course, because it's interesting, we did this on the other side as well and counted how often each model is in the bottom three uh, plausible models in a given catchment. And most amazingly, uh, you see the same thing there. Um, the number of model parameters is a very poor predictor of model performance. And you can typically find a few catchments where every model is one of the, the, the worst choices that you could actually be using. Um, and this is, of course, uh, quite relevant for, for studies that don't use too many catchments um, because you're quite vulnerable to the randomness of the choosing of your catchments uh, for which model results you're going to get out of your study. Um, 
And that is something uh, to possibly keep in mind. Now, back to the question that actually started this entire, uh, this entire works, can we predict which model to use in which place? And for this, um, you know, we're obviously not the first. So again, we can quantify, uh, we can define some expectations. And for this, we go to Fmitscher et al, uh, 2014, uh, who develop uh, several lumped bucket models for uh, different catchments, uh, catchments of different geology. And what they say is meaningful correspondences between catchment structure and model structure can exist even when using lumped conceptual models. So that's great for us. However, they also say hydrologically distinct flow mechanisms could also be represented using similar mathematical formulations. Hello. And uh, that is not such great news because that means that even though uh, the hydrology is different, a single model structure may be able to represent that. Uh, so maybe our expectations should be, there may be a relation between catchment attributes and model structure, but maybe we also shouldn't get our hopes up too much. Um, now the Kimball's data set gives us uh, a lot of information about catchments, right? There's about 50 attributes um, that, uh, that are divided into, uh, among different categories. Um, and what we did is a simple correlation analysis and see how a uh, model ranks um, because we don't like comparing KGE scores because of that benchmarking issue. Uh, so how model ranks change and correlates based on all these individual attributes. And what we see here is that as the base flow attribute goes up, this model tends to rank um, in the lower region. So towards uh, one, so be, become one of the better choices. And if this high flow duration attribute goes up, this model starts to do uh, much worse. Um, now, if we put this in a uh, sort of correlation overview, we get something like this. Um, on, the y, uh, on the X axis are the camel's attributes, so climate, geology, stream flow signatures, uh, soil properties, topography, and vegetation. And on the Y axis, we'll have all our models. So uh, this model tends to rank better if this, this particular climate attribute in green goes up. This is uh, snowfall. Um, and uh, when these dots are purple, that means that when this attribute goes up, this model tends to do worse compared to the other models in our sample. And when I show everything together, I think you'll understand why I didn't bother to put any labels on here. Um, because it's a bit of a mess, right? It's quite hard to, to make, to, to learn something from an overview like this. Um, what we can see is there are strong correlations between the stream flow signatures and most of the, most of the model ranks. Um, there's also quite strong correlations with climate and maybe less so with geology, soil, topography, and vegetation. Um, but like I said, it's a bit of a mess. There's like, there's so many things going on here that make it quite difficult to extract meaningful information. Um, these, these camels attributes are, uh, they have some strong uh, cross correlations. So most of the vegetation attributes correlate quite strongly with the aridity attributes. If the, if a catchment is more arid, most of the vegetation attributes tend to go down. And similarly, if, uh, if a catchment has uh, quite uh, high elevations, you tend to see more snowfall. Um, so these internal correlations, they, uh, they make it a little bit more difficult to determine which of these attributes you should be looking at and which ones are you know, more or less the same. Um, models were calibrated to, to stream flow. So perhaps that we see these strong uh, correlations with stream flow signatures is not entirely surprising. We have that issue that Fenicia highlighted where a single model structure can uh, represent different hydrological regimes. And maybe this works the other way as well, where a different set of catchment attributes can actually uh, produce very similar stream flow regimes. So that introduces some ambiguity. Um, there is uncertainty in the data values, uh, et cetera. Um, is everything bad? No, because uh, these models on the y-axis, they're not sorted by number of parameters or number of stores or anything else. They are sorted by the similarity of their correlation patterns. And when we look at, for example, this first upper chunk, um, this is a bit of a trite example. Um, these models all uh, perform better when this particular attribute goes up. That particular attribute is how much snow falls in the catchment. And these models all share a structural feature in the sense that they all have a snow module. Now, I expect nobody is surprised by this particular finding. 
Um, but I think there is some there's something more. We can extend this line of reasoning to some other models. So for example, these models here, um, they tend to rank better in base flow dominated regimes without too many peaks. And these models all share a certain structural feature, uh, which is a soil moisture routine that has a variable contributing area, which drains into a linear reservoir. Um, and we can extend this again and look at these ones at the bottom here. And these models all have a tendency to rank better in catchments with uh, low precipitation, low mean flows, low low flows, and a large number of high precipitation events. And to me, this suggests that these are drier catchments uh, with low flows that are punctuated by the occasional high flow events. And what these models all have in common is that they have some mechanism um, that uh, allows precipitation to reach the stream quickly. This uh, can be a saturation access mechanism or maybe a bypass mechanism where part of the incoming precipitation is diverted into the stream directly. And what they also have is a way to produce zero flows, which is not something that every model can do. Um, so what we have here is, is really, you know, the really basic example, if, uh, if your catchment has more snow, a snow module helps. But we also have uh, seen this example of models that share a structural feature, uh, soil moisture into linear reservoir, uh, which perform similarly. And this last uh, block here is an example of models that can produce similar behavior and seem to perform similarly across this catchment sample, but they use different mechanisms. Uh, now, this is all quite speculative, so don't use any of this information to start designing new models. Uh, but this is, this is maybe a direction worth uh, of further investigation. And that brings me to, uh, to the summary of uh, what we discussed here. So um, what we've seen is that which regions we can model well really depends on the benchmark that we compare against. Even if we use a strict benchmark, such as the seasonal cycle, model equifinality can still be very high. And it is not the number of model parameters, but how they are used that determines model uh, strengths and weaknesses. But despite general tendencies, uh, no model is the best everywhere, and nor is any model always the worst. Um, but predicting where these models are good or bad from uh, catchment attributes alone is quite difficult, although it does seem possible to group models by similarity in their large sample performance. So, okay, fine. But where does this leave us? And if we now go back to this traditional approach to model setup that I uh, talked about in the beginning, uh, I think this has implications for particularly model choice and evaluation uh, procedures. Uh, like I said before, um, if we are doing model evaluation, comparing our model uh, performance to some ad hoc thresholds um, of NSC is 0 0.75 or KGE is 0 0.5 is, is not particularly helpful and uh, we need more meaningful benchmarks and because these high efficiency scores from high uh, they do not show if the results are actually right for the right reasons so instead what I think we should do is move the focus away from obtaining these high scores and start focusing more on the question what purpose is this model suitable for and um, that includes meaningful benchmarks and that includes using additional or different metrics from these global efficiency scores now, fortunately, um, we don't have to start from scratch here because uh, I'm not the first one to say these, uh, to have these thoughts. Uh, this has been said many, many, many times before. And what I'm highlighting here is just uh, a bunch of papers of people who are actually uh, trying to move the field into that direction. And I think these are all uh, really worth uh, a read. Now, um, there's some consequences for model choice as well. Um, what we sometimes see is uh, that model choice for a given catchment is justified by uh, quoting that something is a, a proven model or widely applied, implying that because it has been used in many places before, presumably it's going to be fine in the, this new catchment as well. Um, I think that approach is a little bit unsatisfying because as we've seen, if you're transferring uh, completely blind, um, your success can be a bit random. You might, uh, you might be basing your uh, your, your, your model choice on a model that performs well in many catchments, but you just happen to transfer it to one of those five where it doesn't actually work well. Um, our correlation approach, where we try to predict where you could, where these models work well, was also a bit unsatisfying because essentially what we did is just, you know, throw all the data at a problem and hope that some interesting pattern pops out. Um, 
which is not as clever as, as some regionalization approaches that exist, but um, it is something that you see quite common with these large uh, sample data sets, so just like correlation analysis, which patterns are there. And I think what we should do instead is maybe not look at individual attributes, but try and convert these catchment attribute data into hypotheses about catchment behavior. And that involves thinking about what could be dominant processes and what could be perceptual models that underlie these catchment data. And if we can do this, what we can then do is connect model performance to catchment types and not to individual attributes. And again, um, fortunately, we don't have to start from scratch here are another two papers that are quite interesting in my opinion. Um, one is about the identification of dominant processes and the other one, uh, the one by Mann et al, is, uh, is an attempt to uh, start from the CAMELS US data sets, bring in some regional knowledge about geology and start defining perceptual models for some of these catchments. And I think this is really the way that we should go uh, to bring hydrologic understanding into these large sample data sets. And uh, some final notes on model similarity and differences. Um, I think the, there needs to be increased attention for model functioning. Uh, why do these models behave differently? Which elements control which part of the, the hydrograph response? Uh, which models are close together in model space? Which ones are far apart? And how can we connect this whole understanding about how the model works to the stream flow regimes that we're trying to uh, simulate? <clears throat> And again, uh, we don't have to start from scratch. Uh, so here's another two papers that, that deserve to be highlighted to show that there, there is stuff out there that can help us make, uh, make these changes. <coughs> Sorry. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll show you a final picture from uh, you know, the living hell that we have to work in in Canada um, and leave you with the summary slide. Uh, if there are any questions, I would be happy to take them. Thank you.